right. So I want to start out, not surprisingly, by giving kind of a motivation and overview for why we think this is important. <clears throat> and fundamentally, it boils down to the idea that science through computing is at best as credible as the software that produces it. So if you don't have good, credible software, um, the science is going to be suspect. And that um, we, we've seen a cycle over the years where we've developed a lot of successful examples of what computational science and engineering can do. And that success has created a positive feedback loop. So we get, um, we get more understanding of the computational science, we get more hardware resources, so we should be able to do more with them. So we develop higher fidelity solvers and we need more diverse uh, higher fidelity models, we develop more diverse uh, solvers and and we keep going around and around as we're trying to adapt all these things to the newest hardware and to use that to get scientific understanding. And these codes are getting so large and complex that the only way to deal with them is really through a separation of concerns. So you need a team of people with different expertise. We can no longer really work in the setting where there's you know, one hero developer who knows everything about the code from beginning to end uh, and, and has um, all the expertise and knowledge that's needed. So we have to work in a team and it's difficult to work in a, a, a piece of software, especially a large and complex one, without some kind of process to help guide how you interact um, and, and what, what the rules of the road are essentially. And then further, um, maybe in the last decade or so, we've seen the onset of a new round of platform heterogeneity. So we've got you know, different types of processors. There's a whole slew of AI and neuromorphic processors coming up. Uh, we're all familiar with GPUs, but now we're seeing more and more different vendors with GPUs and they all have somewhat different architectures. And really the only way to safeguard yourself in an environment like this is to invest in flexible design and robust software engineering process that will make it easier to reliably move your software to new platforms quickly and easily whenever you need to. So there's a lot of challenges in developing scientific applications today. And, and you know, these are not necessarily new, but they really, a lot of them come to the fore lately with all the pressures that we're under. There's a technical side and a sociological side or a human side. So on the technical side, we're doing research and really all parts of the system that we're working with, the software, the model, the math, the solvers, whatever, all of them can be under research by different groups at the same time. Also, the requirements for the software that we produce tend to change throughout the life cycle as we better understand the physics and the, uh, and the science goals change and things like that. Um, all, pretty much all the codes we're working with require uh, floating point math and that greatly complicates um, any kind of verification activity to try to make sure that your code is correct. You have to understand all the um, details at some level to make sure that it's not, um, that you're not getting bitten by the um, fixed precision floating point representation and things like that. And, and, you know, the real world is messy. So the software that we use to model it gets increasingly messy. And of course, I talked about the increasingly diverse uh, computer architectures. And then on the sociological side, we have we all know about competing priorities and incentives the sponsors often care more about scientific publications than the software um, but for us the software is the tool the long-lived tool that helps us produce these scientific publications so we have to find the balance between development and maintenance activities on the code and we have to do this with limited resources and if as i mentioned before we also need interdisciplinary interaction. So we have to, we engage a lot of different people with a lot of different expertise in our software projects. We have to be able to talk and um, also work on the software together with uh, the different uh, expertise, the different languages, and of course, the different uh, focus of attention that everybody has. So we've all seen um, numerous cases of high consequence software related scientific failures. I've just picked a couple to highlight on the slide. One that may be too old for a lot of people to um, remember is the Therac 25 incident. This is um, a computer co controlled radiation therapy system. 
And due to poor software design and development and testing practices, it allowed flaws to um, get into the production system that led to at least six documented cases of substantial radiation overdoses, and three of which were fatal. Um, and then uh, a little more recently, the Mars Climate Orbiter uh, made an incorrect trajectory adjustment uh, as it was going into Mars orbit that caused the loss of the orbiter. And it turned out that there was a discrepancy in the units used by two different software components. So this is pretty widely um, known at the time. So one used metric and one used English. And um, basically, when you get down to it, one component didn't follow the specifications. So that's one problem. And then um, there was inadequate testing at the interface between the two components, which obviously didn't catch this before it went on to the spacecraft. And um, another fact that's a little bit less known is that concerns were raised early in the mission, uh, but they were ignored because they weren't properly documented. People didn't work within the normal system that NASA or JPL, whoever had set up uh, for this. Uh, and uh, they didn't get into the system and they weren't recognized. And you know, we can all cite um, other instances where there have been scientific um, problems, issues, papers having to be retracted and things like that. And uh, these are some of the kinds of things we look to avoid. There are also more subtle impacts on scientific productivity. So not everything um, when you have, you know, code quality challenges leads to a, um, leads to a catastrophe. This is an example from Anchu's work. Um, in 2005, the Flash astrophysics team was offered a unique opportunity to access one of the biggest machines in the world at that time for a dedicated run. They had very little time to get ready for this run, less than a month. Um, and so they did some quick and dirty development of a, a particle tracking capability in the code. Unfortunately, uh, they didn't have time to test it sufficiently and there was an error. And um, so it resulted in duplicated tags due to round off errors. And they had to develop a process to, they, they went ahead with the run. They didn't know until after the fact that they had this problem, but they went ahead with the run. Uh, and then they had to spend six more months uh, processing the results because they had to create tools to um, make up for the error with the duplicated tags and, and things like that. And this all came about, even though Flash had a good solid software practice in place, it was tested regularly and things like that. But um, this was a case where they were rushed and they couldn't apply their full testing process because they didn't have time to do it. And this is the kind of thing that we all face. Uh, this is something called technical debt. Technical debt is the implied cost of additional rework due to choosing an easy or limited solution now instead of a better approach that would take longer. It's like monetary debt. So the more you accumulate uh, of this debt, the harder it is to pay off. And it shows up in a lot of different places. It increases the cost of maintenance. Parts of the software may become unusable over time. Um, you can get questionable results if, you have a, if, the, if you've uh, sort of cheated on the verification of the software. Um, it increases the time for new developers to get on board because things are, are a little bit strange and not well documented. And overall, it reduces the um, software and the scientific productivity. Um, another issue of uh, concern for many of us is that scientific computing facilities provide valuable resources. So a major supercomputer these days often costs $100 million as a rough order of magnitude, and they cost millions more per year to operate. Uh, so if you get a significant allocation on a large supercomputer, it can be worth millions of dollars, literally. You may not have to pay for this, but you have to spend the time and effort to get the allocation. And then whoever's giving the, the support for this uh, is actually interested in what they get out of the allocation. So the sponsor's concern is, are you being a good steward of the resources that you've been given? And your concern should be, are you getting the most science possible uh, out of this allocation, your scientific productivity? But as we've seen, scientific productivity is in the computational science and engineering setting is underpinned by the software quality and software productivity. So good scientific process requires good software practices and good software practices increase scientific productivity. Good software practices also increase software sustainability 
which is important for the long term because that also goes to increasing your scientific productivity in the long term. So I think there's a very strong case to be made here that um, good software practices in the short run and in the long run help improve your scientific productivity. So what are good software practices? For scientific software, there's no universally agreed set of best practices. The specifics will often depend on your uh, situation, the software, how it's used, the team. So, you know, it's different whether it's just you doing something very researchy or if it's something much uh, uh, larger in terms of the team or used in production or things like that. But here I'm going to give you just a couple of uh, perspectives on some of the uh, best practices you might want to think about. Just a second. So the first case is a, a paper simply called Best Practices for Scientific Computing. This was uh, from 2014, Craig Wilson and others, and the URL is up there and also in the webpage for the, um, for the tutorial. Um, and here are the, the really basic principles. Write programs for people, not computers. So you want the, com the people to be able to easily read and understand. Worry about the computers um, you know, and their, their interpretation later on. Um, so make the computer do the work in terms of repeat tasks and automating your workflows and, and things like that. Work incrementally. So uh, build up things by uh, in small steps and with frequent feedback and use a version control system. Don't repeat yourself or repeat others. Um, so every you know, piece of data should have a single um, authoritative location and representation. Uh, don't repeat code, modularize code rather than cutting and pasting it and reuse code instead of rewriting it. Um, these are some, this is a, a concept you'll hear sometimes called dry. Don't repeat. Yeah, don't repeat yourself, DRY. Um, and then also plan for mistakes. So uh, add checks into your code, even if you think this could never happen. Uh, usually between users and programmers, um, you know, all the things you don't think could possibly happen will happen one time or another. So wherever reasonable, add checks to make sure that things are operating correctly. Check all those error returns from the um, library routines you call and things like that. Um, there are lots of unit testing libraries out there these days. You can just pick one for almost any language uh, and use that. You don't even have to invent your own. Anytime you get a bug, turn it into a new test case um, and uh, use a debugger. So a lot of people are used to printf debugging, but there are a lot of um, debuggers out there that are scalable to large scale parallel jobs and things like that that we're often uh, concerned about. And uh, they can be very useful in helping to track things down. A few more, optimize the software only after it works correctly. This is the idea of premature optimization. So um, this happens a lot. You try to write the code in a tricky way because you think it'll be more performant. But if it's wrong, even if it performs quickly, it's not really a help. So really the best approach is to start uh, with the simplest implementation possible, figure out where you're actually paying penalties that you can't afford by profiling the code, uh, and then uh, move to, to improve those sections uh, as needed. There's um, a lot of documentation that you should be doing. Document your design as well and, and the purpose of the code, um, not just not the mechanics of the code. The mechanics of the code are, in a sense, embodied in the code. You need to say why you did that. Uh, and then collaborate. So. Um, We'll talk a little bit about code reviews. Uh, this is a way of collaborating to have other people read your code and uh, try to make sure they understand it um, in the same way that you do. Pair programming is a kind of a more in-depth version of code reviews. Uh, using an issue tracking tool allows everybody to see what's going on in the code, where the issues are, and how they're being addressed. So that's one set of examples. Um, this same, well, not exactly the same team, but uh, uh, another group headed by Greg Wilson uh, decided after a few years that the best practices might be too hard to achieve. So they wrote another paper called Good Enough Practices. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into these in the same level of detail that I did, 
um, before, but I encourage you to look through these because there's there's a lot more in these. And of course, the papers themselves make arguments, uh, make cases for these things, but you should be concerned about data management. You should be concerned about the, the software and actually tracking um, you know, the software itself. Uh, collaboration comes back again, project organization, keeping track of changes with a version control tool, all these kind of things. And you can see there's a lot of different details. <clears throat> and there's a third example that I wanted to mention here as well. Um, the Linux Foundation has a core infrastructure initiative badging program. So this is something that's not really aimed at scientific software. It's more aimed at um, a lot of the infrastructure that will run on production servers and things like that. So for example, an SSL library or a, um, a web server or you know, load balancer or things like that. But it actually provides a really thorough list of best practices. And this is something that you could pick up and choose parts of uh, that might apply to your system. And they also come, so it comes with three levels. There's three different grades, passing silver and gold. Uh, it gives you a combination of musts and shoulds for the criteria. And here's just uh, categories. I'm not even talking, each of these has a number of things underneath it. Um, you can see these all on the site. They all come with justifications, links to justifications for why they have been included in the criteria, which is also a really nice thing to understand. But you can see in this case, they think a, a open source license is very important. Their documentation requirements, project oversight, uh, change control, bug reporting processes, quality. So this is, you know, anything from build systems to testing to coding standards. Um, there's also a security requirement, which may, you may not think makes a, a lot of sense for uh, computational science and engineering types of codes. But actually, surprisingly enough, there's a fair amount of you know, anytime you're doing distributed computing, especially, uh, you really do need to be worrying about security. And even within a system, we see now these supply chain attacks where people are inserting uh, bad code into um, other products. Um, so, so there's a lot of reasons to actually give a little more attention to security. And in addition, a lot of good security practices from a software standpoint are also good software quality practices, which help, can help lead to uh, better reliability, better testing, and, and things like that within your code. Um, they also advocate something which I haven't seen in, in a lot of other places, which is the use of, of uh, code analysis tools. So, um, you know, these are, are like static analysis tools that will process the code like a compiler would, uh, and look for uh, technical errors within the code, things like variables that are used before they're defined and things like that, that are hard to pick up otherwise, but, but this is exactly what a static analyzer can do. So, um, and, and the point of this particular exercise, first of all, that they have some really good ideas for best practices, but also that oftentimes software engineering advice needs to be adapted for the scientific software world. So experiences reported in the wild for all kinds of software don't necessarily consider the special nature of scientific software. But that doesn't mean we should ignore all the scientific, all the software engineering experience that's out there. There's a lot of useful stuff out there. We just have to adapt them to fit the scientific software world. And it's not a matter of saying, oh, that doesn't fit. I'm going to throw it out. It really should be a matter of what is in this that because other people found it valuable, what is in this that I can take into my scientific software work? Don't be afraid to experiment with adaptations. You may try something, you may find it, not, it doesn't work for you, you may need to change, or you may end up giving up. And one approach uh, that I'll talk about in a minute is this piece of process for trying things out. <clears throat> So then you ask, how much time and effort should I spend on software engineering? Well, a rule of thumb is your project should include just enough software engineering so that you can meet your short term and longer term goals, scientific goals, effectively. Um, that sets a fairly low bar. And a lot of people will naturally want to do better. But this is kind of the basics of where you need to be. And an approach that you can use to help get there is this process of continual software process improvement, which we call productivity and sustainability improvement planning. 
There's a link in the box on the right to some more information about that. But the basic idea here is you identify your team's pain points in your software development processes. You pick one and you set a goal to improve it. And you wanna target processes and behaviors, not just maintenance tasks that need to be done. It's not like I need to develop all the documentation for this part of the code. It's how do I ensure that every time I check in the code, I'm also checking in documentation that goes with it, right? Um, pick something that you can address in a few months and it'll give you a noticeable benefit so you can get a nice win out of it. Agree on the plan with the team, identify markers of progress and what is done, how to define when you're done and write them down. And then work your plan, track your progress. When you're done, have a little celebration and then pick your next pain point to address. And what you're trying to do is shown in this curve, uh, this graph on the right, um, you have processes um, and if you keep going on with them, you'll make progress at a certain cost and that's shown in the red line. And by introducing new practices, we're trying to bend that curve over. So you adopt a new um, you adopt a new process at the point where the kink is and it starts to work for you and allows you to make more progress at, at a lower cost. And that's the basic idea. So in today's tutorial, there's a lot of talk, topics that we could cover, but we're gonna focus on uh, helping you improve your scientific software development practices. We're gonna focus on a few topics where the software engineering and advice that's out in the wild tends not to address scientific software. So we're going to talk about project management, collaboration around software development, uh, design, software design, testing strategies, refactoring strategies, uh, continuous integration, and reproducibility for scientific software. So the agenda looks like this. We're going to have, uh, so over two days, we're going to have a break built in, and you can see the times associated with this if you look at the full agenda on the web page. Uh, we're going to have a break during which, um, of course, everybody will need a bit of a break, but we can also uh, uh, be available to answer questions for you. Uh, and then at the end of the day today, we'll have some time for hands-on activities, which relate to the things that we've been talking about. Um, and tomorrow we have two hands-on activity blocks um, because there's actually more work um, that has uh, hands-on content there. Uh, and so we will, uh, this, is, this is what it looks like. And with that, I'm happy to answer some questions from folks and then we will move on to Rinku doing, talking about agile methodologies. So are there any questions that people wanna have, ask?